I will be the first to admit, I'm not exactly a fan of Fire Emblem theories. I think they're generally dumb or hackneyed, or they just seem to be making connections where none really need to exist. That being said, however, there are certainly several diamonds in the rough. And as an active member of the community, active enough that I reached 5,000 subscribers, I think it's time I give back to this community by sharing some of my favorite theories that either I've come up with myself or I've seen in comment sections over my many videos over this time that I've been on YouTube. So sit back, relax, as we look at a few Fire Emblem theories I think are awesome. <laughs> To accept the weapon Armads is to accept a warrior's death. This is what Hector was told when he picked up the weapon in his campaign. He knew, going in, that he would die in battle should he wield the weapon. But he did it because he cared for his friends and he wanted to see the day saved, and picking up Armads seemed like the only logical option. And, of course, as we see in Binding Blade with his fateful confrontation with Zephiel, he did exactly that, dying a warrior's death in battle at the hands of the Mad King. But, thanks to a YouTube commenter, it was brought to my attention that perhaps this warrior's death was in fact beneficial to Hector. How so, you might be asking? Well, let's look at things. Firstly, what do we know about Hector's family? His brother, his mother, and his father all supposedly died from what appears to be the same disease. Now, if it's a genetic disease, that means that Hector's percentage chance of getting this same disease and dying young, just like his parents and his brother, shoots up drastically. So in a way, him being able to take up Armands and survive until the war with King Zephiel allowed him the time he needed to survive Sire Lelina and continue his family line. In essence, Armands saved him from a much sooner demise. It in fact prolonged his life so that he would meet a warrior's end much later than he would have died otherwise. However, the implications of this being a genetic illness means that sadly, the new king of United Lycia may end up outliving his wife and children. This one straddles the line between hopeful headcanon and supported theory. There's certainly evidence to suggest it, and when explained, it does seem to fit. However, I certainly don't think it was what the writers were intending to go for. And that is that Celica was a witch throughout most of Act 4 and didn't know it. Many are quick to point out how uncharacteristic and out of character Celica's actions in Act 4 are. She not only discounts much of her advice that she gets from Mei and Saber, two of her most trusted allies, but she also seems to unconditionally trust Jetta someone who obviously has evil, malicious intent. This is of course explained away partially by the idea that as Celica draws closer and closer to Duma Tower, knowing full well that she will eventually have to give up her soul to save Mila, she's already having her soul sapped throughout most of Act 4, and as her condition deteriorates she becomes more and more distant and more and more abrasive to her friends all thanks to Jeddah's subconscious manipulation. The idea that Celica was under a spell conjured by Jeddah is not too far out of the question, considering how often she secretly convenes with him. And when we consider Halcyon was formerly a Sage of Duma, and him being the one who promotes Celica, who's to say that there wasn't still ties to Duma within whatever spell he used? Not only that, but thanks to Marla and Hestia in the ending chapters, we begin to realize that some of the more powerful witches retain some of their memories as they descend further and further into witchdom, especially if their souls are given willingly as Jeddah leaves us to believe. So the idea that Celica would descend slowly into witchdom 
rather than being fully possessed right away, makes quite a bit of sense, making her possession in Duma Tower not an instant thing that gets her killed, but the result of a slow, sapping, leech-like effect that has been afflicting her since the beginning of Act 4. A common misconception I often see among new fans is the idea that Tearfing and Falchion have a direct correlation with one another. However, someone with a decent grasp on the lore of Fire Emblem 4 and Fire Emblem 1 through 3 are very quick to point out that this is in fact not the case. Tearfing and Falchion are two very different swords that come from very different continents. While they may exist in the same world, they are certainly quite different. Although, maybe not as different as you may have first thought. The idea that Tearfing and Falchion share more of a connection than just similar key art has been one that I've been ruminating on for a lot of my time since I first played Genealogy. And I think our answer lies in the nature of how Genealogy fits within the Akinian timeline. Firstly, we know for a fact that Marth's house, that of Artea, is related to the hero Henri of old, who himself is related to the house of Calphis in Granvale, also known as Sigurd's house. And thanks to additional information provided by Sigurd's very distant descendant Lucina, long into the events of Awakening, we learn that Falchion has changed shape over many years, because while the blade, a fang of Naga herself, is nigh unbreakable. The hilts will wither away with time. It is quite possible that Henri, a descendant of House Calphis, combined the fang sword he was given from Naga with the sword of his family to create an all-powerful weapon that we know in Awakening as the Exalted Falchion. The idea that Tearfing's hilt was used to construct the Achenian Falchion is one that I personally find incredibly interesting and thought-provoking. However, the existence of the Valentian Falchion throws a bit of a wrench into this, as the Valentian Falchion, much like the Achenian Falchion, also has a very similar design to that of Tearfing. So it offers up a second possibility. Since the Valentian Falchion is a twin fang to the other Falchion, it might be possible that all Naga-related blades are forged in the same pattern to represent the dragon herself in some sort of religious ceremony that allows them to look similar purely by the fact that they are forged in honor of the same goddess. And this technique was then later lost as the hilts withered away and needed to be replaced. Our final theory for the day ties sacred stones to Fire Emblem Echoes. In Erika and Saleh's B support, Saleh and Erika speak of a hero named Nada Kuya. Nada Kuya being a legendary hero hailing from Kerpalin. She wielded a sword that was the fang of a dragon. This same description applies exactly to every known Falchion within the Arcania saga. So why would a Falchion or a weapon matching the Falchion's description end up in Kaer Palin. The theory goes that this is in fact the Valentian Falchion, brought to Kaer Palin either by Naida Kuya herself at a young age, or by her family before they settled there. But how would they get their hands on it? Well, there are a few things that we might have to consider. Firstly, Naida Kuya's name is distinctly Eastern, something that would later become characteristic of Chon Sin, a nation in Valentia that is mentioned in Awakening that seems to be a homogenization of both China and Japan in their feudal periods. They also carry Eastern names such as Yenfei, Longqiu, and Seiri, something that Nadakuya fits in perfectly, as does Kamui from Fire Emblem Echoes. It's quite possible that a descendant of Kamui, who was likely one of the founders of Chonsin, perhaps married into the Valentian royal line at some point and inherited the Falchion, before bringing it to Magvel on perhaps a colonization mission, where it remained in Kerpalin. What I find interesting, however, is in the Creature Campaign, 
After clearing the main game, a strange map will appear north of Kael Berlin, called Malkian Coast. It is unknown why this appears only in the creature campaign, but in my mind, it's to say, there is something beyond the Sea of Magvel to the far north, and it may be the source of Natakuya's mysterious blade. So, that brings us to the end of our video. These are a few of my absolute favorite Fire Emblem theories. Now keep in mind, I don't think any of these are actually canon or true to the games. I just think that these are fun to think about and make for interesting discussion points. It's not like it's going to be the end of the world if they aren't true or they're disproven or anything like that. Uh, I just think it's fun to speculate with this kind of thing. So tell me in the comments below what you guys thought of these theories, if you have any more to add, or if you have any counterpoints or anything of the sort, I'd love to hear it. If you enjoyed this video, please leave a like, and if you would like to see more content like this in the future, why not subscribe? I have 5,000 and I can't be any more happy with that. I'm amazed that I've reached this point in a little under two years, and I cannot thank you guys enough for that. It's been so cool watching this channel grow and watching my style evolve as a creator as well. To think I've gone from bad audio quality and pretty bad editing to where I am now is just amazing to me. So thank you guys so much for all of that. Continue subscribing, continue watching. I just, I love making content for you guys and I'd love to keep doing it for a lot longer. So. As we celebrate 5,000 subscribers with a very speculative, interesting, and experimental video for the first time with over 5,000 subs. My name is Zerk Monster Hunter 4, and as always, happy hunting.